Uh, we've been in a series called Meet Jesus. We continue that today, and as we move into January, uh, we'll continue on that same thing, talking specifically about conversations with Jesus. Uh, but today, I want to invite you to turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 2. If you have a Bible, or an iPad, or a Kindle, or a phone, or you, it's going to be on the screen too, so if you just feel like sitting there, that's okay. Uh, Matthew, chapter 2. Uh, we'll be looking at a somewhat what you consider Christmassy passage, uh, which is the visit of the Magi. Uh, the visit of the Magi to Jesus. Uh, so Matthew chapter 2, it's going to be on the screen. Let's read this. Uh, I'll read it out loud for you, and then we'll talk about it. It says this, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod heard this, he was disturbed in all Jerusalem with him. He then called together all the people's chief priests, the teachers of the law. He asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written, quote, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, uh, for, are, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. Uh, he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go, search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they heard the king, they went on their way, and the star had, they had seen when it rose, went ahead of them, until it stopped over the place where the child was, that being Jesus. When they saw the star, star they, the Magi, were overjoyed, on, the, on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. They opened their treasures and presented him with gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been, been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. The word of the Lord. Uh, what we're talking about today is the fact that Jesus is king. And if you read through the book of Matthew, you see this reoccurring theme that Jesus is king, Jesus is King Lee, Jesus is the ultimate king. And uh, we see this kind of hinted throughout the entire gospel of Matthew, the book of Matthew. And uh, we see it from chapter 1. Uh, you see this genealogy of Jesus given, which kind of screams out to the ancient reader and maybe to the really attentive modern reader, Jesus is king. And we get to Matthew chapter 2, and you have this visit of the Magi, and uh, you see once again that the Magi are asking where the king of the Jews is. And again, we're talking about Jesus. So before we talk about what this means, what does it mean for Jesus to be king in your life and in mine, uh, first of all, let's talk about some misconceptions of the We Three Kings. Uh, and probably a lot of you are smart, so this is really not for you. It's for those of you uh, who are not even here who aren't smart. So this is just review, right? But first of all, We Three Kings, uh, there weren't three of them. We, I mean, we don't know for sure. Uh, most of the time when you're talking about these kinds of people, they traveled in caravans. And so there might be 12, 24, 36, I don't know, something like that, a gross uh, not necessarily three of them. Probably a larger number than we've ever thought about. Second of all, they weren't kings. I don't even know where this came from, except from, you know, some bad translations, uh, things like that. But they're magi. They're astrologers. You know those people? Maybe you're one of them. You, on your Facebook feed, you get the little app. You know, I'm a Pisces, and what does Pisces tell me today? Well, this is what they were, but they were the, you know, the really old version of that. Uh, they looked at the stars and they thought, well, if the stars are over here, if they make this constellation or if this point in the sky, this is what it means uh, for me or for the world. That's what they were. They were wise guys. They were wise men. They were uh, advisors. They were really bright people in their day, uh, though their kind of science we'd kind of laugh at uh, in our day. But again, they're not kings. Uh, finally, let's talk about this picture. Uh, it's your typical nativity set. If you look over to your left, you see a, a guy holding a sheep. He's probably a shepherd. Uh, you see Jesus in the manger. Uh, you see Mary and Joseph. Uh, and on the right-hand side, you see the wee three kings. They've got crowns on. Um, one is tan, one is white, and one is black. Uh, they're politically correct kings. Um, and again, 
there's so many things wrong with this picture, I don't even know where to start. But like we already said, there are probably more than three. Second of all, there weren't kings. And third of all, they weren't there. They weren't at the nativity scene. Uh, and we know this because uh, in the passage that we just read, Herod says, how long has it been since you saw the star? And then later on in the passage, what we won't be talking about today, uh, Herod sends out this message, kill all the babies two years and younger, which tells us the Magi appeared two years later, anywhere from uh, 18 months to 24 months after Jesus was born. And another hint is that we're told that the Magi come to the house where Mary and Joseph are at. Uh, so they're not in the barn, they're not in the manger, they're not in the back room of the hotel. Uh, they've managed to, you know, get their own little homestead. And that's where the Magi, all 12, 24, 36 of them, uh, show up to give Jesus their gifts. So misconceptions are, you know, out, off of the table now. Now we can get the right picture in our mind. Are we all on the same page? Good. Okay. So, Jesus is king. This is what this passage is about. Uh, it's a very subtle, it's a kind of political, it's kind of this subversive way to tell the reader uh, things aren't the way you think they are. Jesus, the baby, the two-year-old uh, living in the house, he's actually the one in charge. And uh, when Jesus is king, that does four things uh, I think this passage brings out to your life I'd like to talk about this morning. The first of all, uh, as it sets you on a quest. Now, how many of you have been uh, Black Friday shopping? Yeah, be proud of your shameful act. Um, I've done it too. Uh, a couple years ago, me and my buddy John, uh, we, were we going for ourselves or were we going for the church? We were going for the church, so it was a holy act. Um, we noticed that Target had a TV on sale. And the church needed a TV, and so we thought we were going to go and stand in line and do the whole Black Friday thing in Sioux Falls. Uh, and so, you know, we bundled up as, you know, to basically giant uh, marshmallow men, uh, you know, with the socks and the boots and, and the four pairs of pants and the jacket and the, the three scarves and the hats and mittens and all of that stuff. And then, you know, you go out at like midnight, and you stand in line, and you chat with people that you really never wanted to chat with. Um, I, there was a guy behind us. I don't even remember what he was talking about. He was, he was like, he was just this like, I don't know, pro-gun, pro-military, and managed a way to fit it into every conversation, even if we were talking about TVs, you know, um, which, you know, that's fine, but I'm shivering and cold and not really in the mood to talk about that. Uh, and then, you know, so you stand in line for hours and hours and hours. You're shivering. You start the car. You know, one of you starts the car. You go back. You shiver, you know, in the car. And then you go back in line. And the other person shivers in the car. And finally, you know, it's like 15 minutes before. And then there's that second group of people that you absolutely hate. And those are the people who arrive 15 minutes before and kind of snake their way into the line, uh, you know, 10, 15, 30 yards ahead of you. Uh, and so, you know, the, the, the Target employees are being nice in that they're handing out coffee, but they're not stopping those guys. So all you want to do is throw your coffee at the bad people. <laughs> so it's, you know, this is the experience you go through. So finally, they open up the doors late. You go charging in. You don't know where the TV is. It's Target. It's like five times the size of this room. Uh, and this room's huge. Uh, and you go charging in, you're running, you're sprinting, uh, you're trying to keep your humanity by not throwing elbows, uh, and then you arrive at the giant pallet of televisions. And this is what me and John see, was we see two ladies who look like very average, typical women, prob maybe probably mothers, uh, prob you know, one of them uh, was maybe a little, a little frumpy, a little overweight. Uh, one of them was, you know, maybe a little bit more in shape. They were just typical average people. And yet, both of them had grabbed a single television and were screaming at each other at the top of their lungs, you let go, no, you let go. It's my television, I got here first. Back and forth and back and forth. And everybody's just kind of backing up, <laughs> backing up. What is going on? So there are these things in our lives that make us go a little crazy, that make us turn our lives upside down and do things that we would never consider doing on a normal day. You know, how many of you on a normal day stand in, cold, in the cold for five hours and then sprint to a television and scream at another person? 
That's just not your habit. And if it is, we will not be hanging out. Um, <laughs> the, so we get this. We get the idea that there, there are things that make us, you know, turn our lives upside down. Now, clearly, Black Friday television shopping is a negative example. But the fact of the matter is that we are all familiar with rearranging our lives for the sake of, either of, of something we want. Uh, we've rearranged our lives to the point where we all buy convenience food, microwaves and boxed meals, uh, and nice automobiles in order to save time. And then we use that extra time to pay for a gym membership to work off all the extra weight we got from buying our convenience food and boxed meals. Um, well, some of us spent the time at the gym. Uh, we're willing to get our eyebrows waxed for the sake of beauty, and that just blows my mind. You know, there's a comedian that talks about women who will shriek at the side of, of a spider, uh, but then go pay money to have their eyebrows waxed. Go figure that one out. <laughs> um, we can also find ourselves rearranging our lives not out of convenience, uh, but out of necessity. Uh, we never imagined our lives without our loved one, our brother, our mom, our, our wife, our husband. Uh, but then those people died or abandoned us, or maybe we left them, and now we have our rearranged lives. We probably never thought we could make our lives work without a certain job or income level or square footage of house. But then one of two things happen. One, we lose the job or uh, we, 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 we lose the income that we thought we deserved or we lose that house and our lives are rearranged. We make it work. It probably hurts, but it works. The second thing that happened is that we get an even better job, an even higher income, an even bigger house, and then we suddenly realize that we've not re merely rearranged our lives, but we've actually built our lives around that new income, house, or job. We've, we've rearranged our lives around new circumstances, and we start talking about how we make sure we never lose that income. We protect that house. We start talking about housekeepers and bigger life insurance policies. We feel protective that the government wants a bigger slice of the pie that we never actually expected to have in the first place. My point is that we know what it's like to rearrange our lives based off of a need or a want, based off of conveniences are brute, harsh facts. So then the question comes, when you are confronted with a star rising in the east, with the fact that Jesus is the king and the lord of everything, are we willing then to rearrange our lives? Two, as the Magi did, leave our old lives behind and get closer to the king. Because imagine what the Magi had to do. They live somewhere in the east, the east of Israel, uh, perhaps modern-day Iraq or Iran, um, and they left it all. They go on this ridiculously long journey, and we're not talking about driving in the automobile to Sioux Falls and standing in a line. We're talking about abandoning everything they know, riding on some unfortunate animal for months to make it to Israel. And so when you realize that Jesus is king, it should set you on a quest. Second of all, it makes you want to quell wannabe kings. So I'm not usually the kind of teacher that uses alliteration, uh, but I figured if I do, I might as well do it with you know, one of the most uncommon letters, which is Q. Um, but quell, you know, what I'm, you know what I mean by quell? You know, <laughs> one time when I was uh, like, I don't know, five years old, I was trying to cook hot dogs on the stove, and uh, there was a sponge next to the stove, and the sponge caught on fire. And so I know liquid puts out, liquid puts out fire. And so then I grabbed the closest aerosol can I could find and sprayed it. Bad idea, you know. That, that's not how you quell a fire. Uh, or, you know, we, I like to sing. And believe it or not, when I was a teenager, I was a worse singer than I am now. And, um, and my, I was singing a song, and my sister asked me, you know, who, who sings that song? Uh, and, you know, I like to be the know-it-all, and so I got to be able to say, it's Nora Jones, to which my sister then said, then why don't we, let, why don't we keep it that way? <laughs> right? And so you get that, like, brief second of, like, yes, I know the answer. Ah, I stink. Um, that was a good, that's a, that's a good example of quell. You know, my, the spirit of singing within me was quelled. Um, 
When we uh, realize that Jesus is king, we get sent on this quest to find the real king, to find King Jesus. But as we begin to get to know Jesus, get to know who he is as we meet him, then we begin to realize all the fake, petty, wannabe kings in our lives. And so as we get closer to Jesus, there should be this reaction within us to want to quell those wannabe kings. Uh, and they're, they're the, the kings that are in our lives you know, primarily come from our internal life, uh, our, our desires, our feelings, our intentions, our aims, and our external life, our relationships, how we, how we hang out with people, uh, how we work with them, how we live with them. Um, and so, you know, we all have different kinds of kings in our lives. And by king, what I mean is that, is that, um, that thing, that overwhelming desire, that, um, that thing that defines you, uh, that people would say, you know, explain, you know, Joe to me, explain Anthony to me. And they would say, like, well, he tends to be a little cynical and he probably is, a, you know, a little too sarcastic. Um, but, you know, he tends to be a little idealistic. He probably expects a little too much of people and da-da-da-da-da. And so we have those kind of internal things or, you know, our external life. Explain, you know, explain this person to me. Like, well, you know, he tends to be a, a hard worker. He's always trying to achieve more, but sometimes he does that for, you know, the sake of, you know, he kind of loses relationships in the process. Uh, those are the kinds of kings I'm talking about. Uh, they're kind of subtle. They're kind of nebulous. They're, they're incorpor- incorporeal. They don't necessarily have a body to them. And yet, they're, they're, they're those things that kind of run our lives really, really dangerously, really quietly, that you don't even notice it's happening. Uh, so for the internal life, and I have some examples written down, you've got, you know, cynicism. It's been bad before. It's going to be bad again. Uh, you've got self-imposed naivete, uh, which basically, <laughs> ignorance is bliss. The less I know, the less I have to worry about. Oh, those famines in Africa, well, if I don't know about it. I don't have to do anything about it. Oh, you know, that person who's sick uh, in the cubicle next to me, like, well, I don't want to know too much about their issues because then I'd feel bad. Uh, or Mickey Mouse syndrome, which is all happy all the time. <laughs> um, or Eeyore syndrome, which is all sad. Poor me all the time. Uh, we have, and these things can, can drive us. They can push us, right? They can, they can define our day. They can make our days great or bad. Uh, they can define our relationships, uh, our external life. We can always be trying to wor- be working to improve everybody else's opinion of, of me. Um, or we can be non-honest, non-committers. You know, what, you know what I mean? Like you call somebody up, they go to a party, and uh, you're like, I don't know. They're like, well, you know, maybe. I'm not sure. Uh, And then you realize that you do that with your entire life. Well, maybe. I don't know. I'm not sure. Uh, And then, you know, then who are you? Uh, Or, you know, maybe you're a human. You're not a human being. You lost that part of you a long time ago. You're a human doing, you know. I must achieve more all the time. Uh, These are all the different kinds of kings that reside within us that when you realize that Jesus is the true king, you got to quell them. you got to say, I'm done with you. You don't rule my life anymore. I'm not going to be defined by you any longer. Third of all, when you realize that Jesus is king, it sets you on a quest. It causes you to rearrange your life, and that quest makes you realize that there are fake kings that you have to quell. And third of all, it has you question assumptions. It makes you wonder if things are really going to happen like you'd expect. For I don't know what reason, I had a dentist who told me toothpaste really wasn't that necessary. And maybe, I don't know, maybe he's right. My suspicion now is that he just wanted me to have more cavities. (laughs) And so I went through an embarrassingly long portion of my life not using toothpaste and have an embarrassingly high amount of, you know, historical cavities. Um, and then, you know, I, I told my then-girlfriend Emily this, and she's like, are, are you nuts? Are you crazy? Use toothpaste. And then I started using toothpaste, and I got less cavities. Imagine. 
Imagine. Now, there are things in your life that you have assumptions about. Maybe the somebody told you with your mouth hanging open and a bib for your touching your drool, you don't need toothpaste, right? Maybe, the, maybe somebody told you some assumptions that you're still clinging on to today. But when, you, but when you realize that Jesus is the king of everything, when you realize that Jesus is actually the creator of the universe and probably knows quite a lot about it, when you realize that Jesus is the one uh, who, who created people and came to live and to die and be resurrected to save people, then your assumptions about who he is and what he can and can't do and who he would and wouldn't hang out with, uh, they change. Now, the reason I'm pointing this out in this particular passage is that in Matthew chapter, chapters 1 and 2, we see a lot of this kind of upside-down kingdom uh, where the Magi, they're Gentiles, they're astrologers. Uh, if you're a religious Jew that day, you're looking down on the Magi because they're basically pagans. And yet it's the Magi who take the quest to go see Jesus. But here's the irony. Before they go see the king of the Jews, they go see Herod, the literal king. And they ask him, where's the king of the Jews? Which is basically a big old slap in the face to Herod. Well, I'm the king of the Jews. And so Herod calls together uh, the priest and the teachers, and he says, where is this you know, Messiah figure supposed to be, uh, supposed to be born? And here's the, the even deeper, I don't know, irony is that they had the answer. They knew. They knew it was supposed to be in Bethlehem. But what did they do about it? Nothing. They're not the ones who went and to go see the Messiah. They sent the Gentiles, the pagans, the Magi. In Matthew chapter 1, you see this genealogy of Jesus. And most genealogies that day were first of all made up of all males. You didn't really bother mentioning the women. And second of all, if you're talking about uh, the, supposed, you know, the supposed savior of the Jews, of Israel, you would hope that everybody in your genealogy uh, was a Jew, was an Israelite. But if you read carefully through Matthew chapter 1 and that genealogy, you actually find several women. And each of those women, first of all, weren't Jewish. And second of all, they were actually pretty sexually promiscuous. They were not necessarily what you'd call the big honorable women of the day. And so Matthew, the writer of this gospel, is trying to tell us something. Things aren't always going to be the way you'd expect. So what if the very people you think are unworthy of getting close to Jesus are in fact the very people who are closer to him than we even know? What if the folks that you automatically put on a pedestal are the ones who are actually struggling with Jesus' identity? We all have expectations of what God and Jesus can and can't do. Jesus would never vote that way. Jesus would never hang out with those people. Jesus would never hear my prayer. Certainly, he would never show up in a, as a baby in a backwater town. Certainly, he would never die the death of a political insurrectionist. Certainly, certainly, certainly. But what Matthew chapter 2 shows us is that things aren't always as we thought. When we put words in Jesus' mouth about who, or, uh, who can or can't uh, he hang out with, basically we're just choosing our own prejudices and then making sure we feel better about them because we think that God backs us up on this one. Anne Lamott puts it this way. You can safely assume that you've created God in your own image and it turns out that God hates all the same people you do. Man, that's, that's rough. That's a rough. That's a rough truth right there. What assumptions do I have about my God, about what he likes and doesn't like, what he thinks is great and what not so great? It really just turns out to be my preferences. Finally, when you realize that Jesus is king, it sets you on a quest to know him. And in that quest, you... You begin to quell all those fake wannabe kings. And as you do that, as those kings begin to disappear from your life, then you begin to question, well, maybe God's a little bit better than I thought. Maybe his love's a little bit bigger than I thought. Maybe his beauty is a little bit more grander than I thought. 
and then you can't help but be quenched. Because all of us have this thirst within us, a thirst to love and to be loved, and a thirst to worship, because all of us worship something. All of us bow down to something. Sometimes it's ourselves, sometimes it's someone else, sometimes it's something else. But what that is, is that inside all of us, we all have this need, this deep-seated desire to glorify God. When we fully live lives that recognize Jesus as king, it's only then that we can be fulfilled. Worshiping God quenches a need within us that we probably never even know, knew we had. Some examples. Do you remember uh, the first time you successfully wakeboarded? <laughs> or climbed a mountain? Or saw the ocean? Or maybe it was when you held your newborn child or the first time you saw them ride a bike or walk down the aisle. Or maybe for you it was the first time you could afford to try filet mignon or lobster tail or Nutella. Or maybe for you, it was when you gazed upon your unclothed spouse for the first time or the first time you met that special someone and something just clicked. Whatever it was, you probably know the feeling of a yearning being met, a satisfaction coming to you, but you didn't even know you had that yearning in the first place. And maybe some of you today feel this vague gnawing at your insides, something incorporeal, whispering in the synapses of your brain and the strings of your heart that your life is not complete, that your purpose is not fulfilled, and whatever quest you are on currently is probably the wrong one. But when we see that Jesus is king and we respond, when we enter into a beautiful quest that leads us to quell the fake kings that demand our attention, and when we quell those kings so that we can question our misinformed assumptions, and we finally come to Jesus and fall down and worship him like the magi giving their gifts, giving him all we are, then that thirst, that crawling in the desert mirage-inducing thirst, that vague and yet powerful thirst, that neck-deep, sky-high, painful, yet easily ignored thirst is finally, finally quenched because Jesus is king, and that's what he does. So, some questions. There are no application groups today. It doesn't mean I'm not going to give you some application questions. You can't escape. <laughs> because of Jesus' kingship, has your life been rearranged? Fully? Completely? Utterly? Have you left your proverbial country, the place that you're most comfortable with, like the Magi, and gone on a quest? If not, what do you think is keeping you back? What scares you about moving forward, about setting forth on your quest to King Jesus? Second of all, what old wannabe kings in your life need quelled? How do you suppose you'll go about doing that? I'll give you some hints. Quelling kings in your life is not just something that you decide to do. It's a process, and it tends to be long and treacherous. And that's why we talk about spiritual disciplines and accountability and study and prayer. Our goal here at Good News as staff and elders and deacons and leaders as we want each and every one of you to be in a long-term discipleship process, a commitment that you enter into more than just an hour on a Sunday, but for the rest of your life that says, I've got these kings, they're trying to rule me, let's quell them. Third of all, is there some assumptions about what Jesus can't or won't or couldn't possibly do that you need to let go of? Unlearn. Begin to question. In other words, I'm asking you this. Is there a prejudice that you need to let go of as well as stop thinking that Jesus supports you in? Is there a prejudice in your life that you need to let go of as well as stop thinking Jesus supports you in that prejudice? Fourth and finally, is there a general sense in your life that there is some thirst, some longing that needs quenched? 
could it possibly be that King Jesus is asking for your worship, your life, your all? Could it be that he is asking everything of you so that he can be everything to you? How will you respond? Let's stand and pray together. King Jesus, I want to pray for myself, for my friends in front of me. Uh, We are needy people. And we have assumptions about you, assumptions about ourselves, assumptions about the way life is that I'm pretty sure probably wrong. And so my prayer for myself, for my friends, is the God that you would teach us, that you would show us what those thirsts are in our life that need quenched, that you would reveal to us on a day-by-day basis that you are king and that we need to quest after you, leaving it all behind and pressing on towards you. And Father, I ask that all of us would be in all of us would be in a lifelong, long-term discipleship process. And God, whatever fears, whatever distractions, whatever uh, things get in the way of that in our lives, God, may we push them aside and press on towards you. We thank you for your love. It never ceases, it never fails, it never stops, it never lets go. Thank you for pursuing us. We love you, God. Amen.